Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 31. Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 31. I'm going to read it in New Living Translation. Praise the Lord. All right. It says, this is Jesus speaking, right? Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. Verse 35. And then Jesus asked them. No, no, I'm going to stop right there. All right. Now, let's really quick. Let's go to. Let's go to Matthew. I think it's Matthew. Yes, Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 69. Matthew 26, verse 69. Are you already? If you have it, say I have it. If you don't, say wait a minute. No, there's no wait a minute. Let's go. Right? So verse 69 says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside of the courtyard. A servant girl came over to him and said, uh, You are one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Later, Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath, I don't even know the man, he said. Verse 73, a little later, uh, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore a curse on me. If I'm lying, I don't know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. I'm going to read verse 73 and 74. I'm going to read in King James Version really quick. It says, and after a while came unto them that stood by, and Peter said, and said to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Say, betrayeth thee. He says, Your, thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and swear saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crowed. Heavenly Father, have your way. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, speak through me. Give us hearts to receive. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, there's this, there's this uh, story in Genesis. There's a story in Genesis, for those who don't know this story, it's, it's about the Tower of Babel. And the Bible says that the people were all of on one accord. They were all of one language. Say language. They were all of one language, and the, and the Bible says they began to, to make this tower. And they says, we're going to make this tower to make a name for ourselves, right? So they're going to make this tower that's going to just reach up high, and it's, it's going to make a name for our, ourselves, right? And the Bible says that the Lord came down to see the tower that was being made. And the Lord said, surely these people are on one accord. They are of one speech, and whatever they desire to do, they would be able to do it. This is, what the, this is what God is saying. He's saying, listen, they are, they are unified. All the people are unified, and whatever it is that they desire to do right now, they're going to be able to accomplish it. And then the Bible, then the Lord says, um, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to confuse their languages. And he does, and he does that. He, he, he confuses their language. All of a sudden, you were, you were just speaking English. All of a sudden, now you're speaking Portuguese. And somebody else is hearing Mandarin and somebody else is hearing and they're hearing all these like, what? I can't I can't communicate with you because I don't know what you're saying. And then they begin to disperse with one another. Like they begin to disperse in different areas because they couldn't understand one another. This is why we have so many different languages in so many different parts of the country. I mean, all of this makes sense. Y'all remember Pangea? Y'all remember the theory of Pangea? In school, where they, they said all the earth, earth was together, like all the land was together in, in, in one piece. You know that's biblical. The Bible says in Genesis that the, the land began to, at, at, right after Babel, the land began to break apart. 
That's why when all the, you put all the land together, it fits in one piece. But then the Bible says they begin to spread. So after the flood of Noah, after that, it began to spread. So this is why other people in different countries speak different languages. Because as they spread out, the land began to spread out. It's all biblical. Amen? Amen? So God was like, whatever they desire to do, they're unified. I said, I, I got I to gotta break this because whatever they desire to do that's not in my name, they're still going to be able to accomplish it. And the problem was they were trying to make a name for themselves instead of making a name for the Lord. And God says, I cannot let this happen because this is not about man. Listen, the life that we live is not about us. It's about what God has designed and purposed for us and through us. Amen? And God said, I cannot have this happen. I'm going to confuse their languages. You're going to speak Spanish. You're going, you're going to speak English. You're going to speak Greek. You're going to speak. And it just began to just disperse all these different languages amongst the people. Right? Which lets me know that a, a key component to unity is language. I'm going to say that again. A key component to unity is language. That's good. Well, praise the Lord. I'm going to say it one more time. A key component to unity is language. It's hard to unify with someone who does not speak the same language. Now, I'm not saying people who speak English cannot unify with someone who speaks Spanish. I'm not saying that at all. We got to look deeper. If you're speaking a language of victory, it's hard to unify to someone who speaks the language of depression. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the what? The tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. In other words, whatever you speak, you eat. Uh, you, you've been dieting on depression because you've been speaking it for so long. You've been dieting on anxiety because you've been speaking it for so long. You've gotten to the point where you claim it. You say, my anxiety has been acting up. Oh, I don't like going over there. It messes with my anxiety. What, who, who gave that to you? When God designed you, he didn't say, oh, yeah, you're going to have a beautiful singing voice. Oh, yeah, I'll make you look a little bit handsome. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Oh, anxiety. I forgot about that. No. He wasn't like, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of depression in there. This is not how God designed you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. But we're claiming these things and we're expressing it in our language. And as we continue to express it in our language, we're continuing to eat the fruit of it. You've been saying these children make me sick for so long. You literally got sick. Did you know that God spoke this world into, into existence? And you, did you know that he made us in his image and likeness? That he's given us the creative power just like he has? And it's crazy Watch this. It's crazy that the world has grasped this concept, but the church still, we, we still struggle in this area. The world has grasped this concept. And I'm, I'm going to speak, I'm going to manifest it in the universe. And then it happens, and they believe that the universe provided it for them. No, they just lean on a biblical principle. And God's word will never return void. They just leaned on the principle. But I, I, I got a news flash. What camera is on? I want to look into the camera. I got a news flash. The universe don't have ears, but God does. <laughs> See, he heard you say, he heard your little prayer, even though you were speaking to the universe. He heard your prayer. He intercepted your prayer. And by his grace, he says, you know what? I'm going to give it to them anyway. Yeah. 
We got to understand there's power in the language that we speak. Can people identify the God in you based on the language that you speak? Oh, man, I'm going oh, 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 to mess some people up. Because some of y'all been working for the same people for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they can't tell you're a Christian because your language doesn't sound like one. I need somebody that care about following me or something because, okay, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Listen, I, I, I really want people to understand this because many people watch this. You will be the only Bible they read. So when they crack open Jordy's Bible, will they see the word of God? You will be the only Bible they read. The unbelievers aren't reading the Bible. They're reading you. And they're going to decipher within themselves whether or not the Jesus that you serve is real based on the language you speak, the way you carry yourself. hilarious to me to see your faces because some of y'all hallelujah in church and cuss people out in traffic uh oh come on come on you uplift your neighbor in church but you pound your kids to the ground when they mess up What language do you speak? Ask yourself, what language do I speak? Do I speak the language of heaven? Do I uplift? Come on. Do I, am, I, am I spewing out love, joy, peace? It's the fruit of the spirit evident in the language that I speak. Come, I don't really want to help some people out. Some folk don't want to call on you because whenever stuff hits the fan, you're spewing out anxiety and panic. So when they're going through, they don't want to call on you because you're going to make it worse. You're sprinkling your adobo of worry. Your sasson of fear. Notice how the Hispanic people laugh first. <laughs> ja, 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 ja. Praise the Lord. Because we, we, listen, we have to understand that our language plays a big part in how others respond to the Christ in you. Nobody wants to serve your Jesus if your Jesus is cussing people out. Nobody wants to serve your Jesus if your Jesus is responding in fear. Come on. At what point do you lean and have faith on God? At what point does your faith become your anchor in the midst of adversity? When the storm comes, are you asleep like Jesus was? Are you panicking like the disciples were? It'll show you how much faith you really have. Some of y'all bought up every water at Walmart when you heard the storm was coming. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to be prepared. I'm just saying, listen, leave some water for somebody else. It's wise to be prepared. But listen, at some point, fear can, listen, you cannot let fear dictate your life. I'm going to try to help some people out. You know, bought everything. All the waters, all the canned goods. Now my baby's ain't got no Chef Bardi because you took it all. <laughs> I'll just play with y'all. So watch this. So in Luke chapter 22, right? So we're back in Luke chapter 22, right? And Jesus tells Peter, he says, listen, the devil desires to sift you like wheat, right? And that can be said about everybody in this building. 
I'm going to say that again. That could be said about everybody in this building. The devil desires to sift you as we. He wants to sift. He wants to cut you away from the body of Christ. He wants to remove you out of the fold. He wants to take your faith. The devil, desi he's desiring to sift every last one of us like we. Just cut us away. This is the devil's desire. So he's looking for every single space and opportunity to present his ugly head and pull you out of the place that you're called to be. So this is what Jesus is telling Peter. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. Right? That's what he says. Right? In Luke chapter 22, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Right? Verse 32. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith, say faith that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you. I am even ready to die for you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times. You will deny me three times. And I love Peter. Listen, Peter, he thought he had it together. He, he was like, yo, I will die for you, Jesus. Yeah, Peter was a gangster to me, in my mind, when I read it. When I read it, he had a limp. I'll die for you, Jesus. But he, he's like, Lord, I'll go to, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. I will die for you, Jesus. And that's many of us Christians. We talk a good talk, but it's not a byproduct of our faith. Watch this. We talk a good talk covering our insecurities there's a difference just because you said the right things that doesn't mean it's coming from the right place I'm, I'm trying to help some people out just because you said the right thing that don't mean it came from the right place okay okay I'm going to help some people out how many times when the customer annoyed you or the person in your family annoyed you, and you said, okay, God bless you. You didn't really want to bless them, but you said what was right, but you didn't say no, But what you did was you tried to say it to try to annoy them. Yeah, see, there it is. You said the right thing. Jesus loves you, but you didn't say it in, uh -oh, you didn't say it in the right mind. It wasn't the right motive behind it. Can I help some people out? Motive is a part of your language as well. <laughs> Jesus loves you. You know, what you, you know what you just did? You made them hate Jesus even more. That's what happens. When you say it with the you just said it just to annoy them. They cuss you out. You're like, Jesus loves you. You didn't say it with the right motives. You didn't truly want them to know that Jesus loved them. So now they don't want your Jesus. Motive is a, listen. So G, uh, listen, Peter had all the right things to say. I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll die for you, Jesus. But the reality is he was struggling with who he was in Christ. Because just a minute ago, Peter, Peter, Peter had a revelation of Christ. He was like, yo, Jesus, you are the son of God. You're the, you're the Messiah. And the next thing you know, Jesus is like, I'm about to die for y'all. And, and Saint, uh, Peter was like, not on my watch. And Jesus was like, get thee behind me, Satan. Wait, hold on. This is what Jesus said to Peter. Well, to, 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 to what was influencing Peter. Get, the, get thee behind me, say. So you gotta, you got to think, at this point, Peter's perplexed. He's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just had a revelation of Jesus, but then Jesus spoke to me and was like, get behind me, Satan, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I got, I got, I have to show them that I'm a ride or die. I, I'll die for you, Jesus. And Jesus was like, <laughs> Peter, Peter, Peter. He's like, listen, you're going to deny that you even know me. When push comes to shove, you're going to even deny. You thought you would die for me? You're going to deny that you even knew me. And that's a reality check for all of us. 
Because many of us, we think we're strong in the faith, but we can't even fast for three days. What's going to happen when they say take the mark of the beast or die? That's coming. That time is coming. There's going to be a time where they're going to say either you take the mark of the beast either in your hand or in your forehead. And if you do not take that mark of the beast, you won't be able to buy or sell any goods. That's what it says in Revelation. But you think you're going to stand on your faith and be able to deny that mark when you're starving? But you say you can die for Jesus. This is a reality check. I know this is a hard one. This is a tough one, but it's real. Can I help some people out? There's a, there's a, there's a Walgreens on International Drive that's already set up for the Mark of the Beast. It's already set up. The freezers are set up to a put in a way where you have to scan your head or scan your forehead just to get it open. It's already set up. And more and more is being set up that way. More and more stores are being set up that way. Y'all, listen, the end is closer than we think. We think we're going to patty cake the devil, and we're going to patty cake our, with the word of God, and we're just going to play both ends, both sides. No, there's going to be a time where God's going to draw the line in the sand, and he's saying, pick a side. Pick a side. And it got to that point for Peter. They done took Jesus. After Jesus was like, yo, you're going to, hey, there's going to be a time you're going to deny me three times before the ro- ro- rooster even crows. You're going to deny me three times. Then they came. They took Jesus. They're about to crucify Jesus, right? They're going through the process of beating him and, and they're all this stuff. And Peter's following behind. He's, he's paying attention. He's following behind. And that's when we get to Matthew chapter 26. And the Bible says that one of the servant girls f- saw him. And it was like, he was with, he was with Jesus. And Peter was like, um, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that guy. The same dude that was just like, yo, I'll die for Jesus, just denied him. I mean, he said it with confidence in front of his homeboys. But when the enemy came around, where was his confidence? Where was his faith? Many of us, we have a lot of faith in church. But what happens when the struggle hits? What happens when anxiety tries to creep up? Where is your faith then? We, we can love the people who love us. But can you truly love your enemy? I tell you all the time, your fruit is highlighted in the midst of trouble. Not in the midst of everything going good. Everybody got the fruit of the Spirit when everything going good. Even the world got the fruit of the Spirit when everything going good. No, your fruit is highlighted when the trouble hits. When the enemy comes up against you. When adversity comes, that's when your fruit is highlighted. That's when they can say the love of God is truly in you. It's when the struggle happens. It's when the trouble happens. Many of you, you're trying to rid your life of trouble when the reality is trouble is what's highlighting Christ in you. Jesus didn't die to save us from trouble. He died to give us peace in the midst of trouble and to redeem us to a place of eternity with him. This Bible ain't designed to to rid you of trouble. It's, It's designed to reconstruct your mind to trust him in the midst of trouble. Come on. So Peter, he's, the servant girl's like, hey, he was with Jesus. Peter was like, no, that's not me. Then the Bible says another servant girl came up and said the same thing. He was with Jesus. And Peter was like, no. That's, no, no. And he, he said with an oath this time, I swear it wasn't me. Then the third time, people, these people are like, wait a minute. But this is, this is, this is where it gets interesting. Because the third time around, watch this, verse 73, after a while they came unto him, I'm reading the King James Version, and they stood by and said to Peter, surely thou art one of them, right? For your speech betrayeth you. It's very interesting. They were able to identify Peter because of the way he spoke. They was able to identify that Jesus was with Peter based on the way he spoke. 
I know he was with Peter because he says the things that Jesus said. I know he was with Jesus because he says the things that Jesus said. Can they say the same thing about you? I know Caesar has been with Jesus because he says the same things Jesus would say. That when the storm came, Emma said, peace be still, because Jesus said it. They was like, I, I know Peter had been with Jesus because his, the language he speaks sounds a whole lot like Jesus. Can you say the same thing about yourself? Do, does What echo from my mouth? Does that, does that sound like Bible? Does it sound like the word of God? My Bible says perfect love cast out all fear. But why is there so much fear being seasoned in your language? My Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but with prayer and supplication, make your request known unto man. Then the peace of God will keep your heart and your mind. That peace that passes all understanding. So why is it that your language is so filled with anxiety when the Bible says to be anxious for nothing? Your language should sound like prayer, not like panic. We need to make a shirt, prayer over panic. Oh, I like that. Prayer over panic. Come on. If the Bible says that our father owns a cattle on a thousand hills, why are you continuing to declare that you're broke? When the Bible says we are joint heirs with Christ, why in the world are you acting like you don't have access to anything? Listen. I'm trying to help some people out. Yeah. Try to help some. Because reality is we have to be able to have faith in our language. Our language isn't structured in faith. We're not anchoring our faith in, in, in our language in, in our faith. Nobody can see the faith in you because you don't speak the language of faith. And because now the enemy knows, how, watch this, the enemy knows how to confuse our language in the church. Now the church is no longer unified. Because everybody's speaking a different language. Listen, I really want to help some people out. This is the reason why we feel the glory of God so heavy during Friday Night Fire. Because we, in a moment in time, we all begin to speak the same language. And when that happens, we see what's going on in heaven appear on earth. And we experience a, a glory that we've never experienced. Listen, am I the only one who feels it? Am I the only one who sees it when it happens? We all begin to speak one language at one time. Then we see heaven manifest on earth. And then we see everybody getting free, getting delivered, getting healed. Repentance, we've seen it all. Somebody threw their evil eye on the altar. We have to understand that there is so much beauty when we can unify in speech. When we can communicate the, the language of heaven. Watch this. We're going to go to James chapter 3. Then we're going to get up out of here. James chapter 3. I'm almost done, y'all. I ain't one of those pastors that be like, <laughs> I'm closing. And then I'd say it like four more times. James chapter 3. Well, my, my pages don't want to act right.
James chapter 3, verse 2. All right, James chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. I'm reading a New Living Translation. Roger. He says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect. I'm going to say that again. He says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. Verse 3, We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of, the, of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder can make huge ships turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. Verse 5. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark could set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame, is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body it can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself verse 7 people can tame all kinds of animals birds reptiles and fish but no one can tame the tongue it is restless and evil full of deadly poison and sometimes it praises our lord and father and watch this and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of god Verse 10, and so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. That's what he says. Surely, your blessing and your cursing. He says, surely, this is not right. right? Watch this. Verse 11, does a spring, wa spring of water bubble out with both fresh and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. He's like, why in the world are you claiming to love Jesus but speak like the world? He says fresh water and trash water, junky water, cannot flow from the same spring. Cannot flow from the same fountain. Why is it that we're being poor representation of Jesus based on our speech? He says, this is not right. We need to change our language. Now watch this. This, this, is, this is where it gets kind of funny. Because in the same text, he says we cannot control our tongue. Well, pastor, how am I supposed to change my language if I can't control my tongue? This, this is what I'm trying to tell you. It's not by our doing. It's about giving Holy Spirit access to every area of our life and say, Lord, you can have control over my tongue. I give you control over my speech. I listen. I'm just going to read and I'm going to allow you to use the word of God to speak through me because God, I can't do it on my own. I've tried. I tried to stop cussing, but I keep cussing these boogers out. I tried to stop. Listen, I tried to stop lying, but I continue to lie. I tried to listen. I really need some people to understand this. I tried to stop gossiping, but God, gossip just keeps spewing out of my mouth. But if you you can make the choice today and say, Lord, I'm giving you full control over me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm giving you full access to my speech, to my eyes, to my ears. I'm giving you complete control. Because when you give Holy Spirit access to your heart, watch this. The Bible says this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth. The problem with many of us is we haven't given Holy Spirit full access of our heart. And because we want to keep control of this area of our heart, it's affecting that area of our speech. I, listen, I, I, I'm asking, I'm, I'm begging you guys, give Holy Spirit complete access. Don't be that one that's be like, oh, Jesus, you can have my, you can have my, uh, my, my, my work side of me. But um, relationship-wise, I, I want to control that. I give you all of me, but this, this area of unforgiveness, I, I'm going to control that. No, no, he wants your whole heart. He wants every nook and cranny. 
every bit of it. Every bit of it. The trust issues, he wants that too. Because if you continue to try to c- control the little trust issue area, you keep that wall up, watch this, that little bit of rejection that's in your heart is going to cause you to miss, uh, watch this, to misview every relationship in your life. So when somebody doesn't respond to you the way you want it to be responded to, all of a sudden rejection puts his little two cents in. Now you don't want nothing to do with them. I'm trying to help some people out. He wants full access. Say full access. He wants complete control over your heart. So watch this. So those areas that you've been controlling will no longer dictate the way you respond to people. People will see the language of heaven spewing out of your life, out of your, uh, come on, out of the way you just, you just carry yourself. The language of heaven will continue to glow through you. Can I help some people out? 80% of communication is actually body language. Somehow y'all speak like Jesus, but you don't carry yourself like Jesus part of your language you say you have the victory but you carry yourself like defeat come on listen listen I played sports a great portion of my life all the way up until adulthood I played sports I was a football guy right many years I played quarterback Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When, you, when you're the quarterback, you're often seen as the leader of the team. So even in the times where our team is are just getting beat down, I had to carry myself in a way that says, no, we can come back. We got this. We have everything that it, it, we, we need to, to come back in this game. You have to carry yourself like that because everybody's looking to you. And when they're seeing the leaders defeated, the rest of the team becomes defeated. Can I, I really want to help some people out. Believe it or not, many of you are the leaders of your family. Yeah. Even the ones that are older than you are looking to you. Why? Because you have Jesus and they don't. But if you're looking defeated, where's the hope for the family? Come on. Can we be the leaders in our community and carry ourselves in victory? This is why the Bible says walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot let circumstances dictate our language. We don't speak based on circumstance. We don't speak based on the opinions of others. We speak based on the word of God, identifying with the word of God and saying that's who I am, not what you called me to be. Now we speak the language of heaven. Because I identify with God and what God says about me, not what my aunt says about me, not what my haters say about me, but I identify with what God says about me. I've given him my entire heart, and now I'm going to spew the love of Jesus when times are high and when times are low. Let's be walking representations of Christ. Let's not deny him with our language. Watch, watch how the enemy is. They go to Peter. It was like, your speech betrays you. This is, how re- this is how Peter switches it up. He starts cussing to sound like the world because he didn't want to be identified with Jesus in that moment. But I need some people who are bold enough to say, I would rather be identified with Christ, come on, and be hated by man than to be loved by man and rejected by Christ. Peter switched up. He starts cussing, trying to sound like the world. There was an old snap. They found me out. Based on my speech, so let me change my speech. He's like, bleep, 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 bleep. That ain't me. Bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> Peter. And then the rooster crows, and he remembers what Jesus said. And he runs. 
he runs, he runs away. He, and, and watch this, watch this. I, I, I love Jesus. I, I listen, I love Jesus so much. Watch, watch with Jesus. Because this Jesus already had a backup plan. I love this. Watch this, and then we out of here. Notice what Jesus told Simon back in Luke 22, verse 31. Notice what Jesus said before all of this happened. Notice what Jesus said. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan is after, asked to sift you like wheat. He says, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. Watch this. So when you have repented and turned to me again, you can strengthen your brothers. Jesus is already telling Peter before he even told Peter that he was going to deny him. He says, once you've repented, once you've returned, you're going to have a story that's going to encourage those who may have rejected Jesus. You're going to have a story. You're going to have a testimony that's going to bring strength to those who ha doesn't have the language of heaven. He says, I've been praying for you even in the midst of you talking like the world. I've been praying for you. I've been interceding for you even when you've been gossiping. I've been praying. I've been interceding for you. So once you come back to me and your language begins to shift, you'll be able to shift the language of everybody in your circle. Jesus is praying for you even in your low point, even in your low place, even in your low moment, even in the moment where you have not been sounding like Jesus. Jesus has already been praying on your behalf so now that you've repented and you're coming back to him he's saying now you're going to have a testimony in your language that's going to show the redemptive power of Jesus Christ I want to say Lord change my language Lord change my language my all standing change our language Father Lord, we don't want to talk like the world anymore. We don't want to carry ourselves like the world anymore. But God, we want to be identified with you based on the way we carry ourselves, based on the way we speak, based on the way we communicate. We want the love of Jesus to be found in every area of our lives.